Hi, I'm glad you stopped by. You're looking at the 1849 broadside. Not every single, you know, portion of it, but the lion's share of it. We're going to take a look at some of the important parts and we'll get started right here. At the commencement of the Holy Sabbath, January 5, this is 1849. We engaged in prayer with Brother Belden's family at Rocky Hill, Connecticut, and the Holy Ghost fell upon us. I was taken off in vision to the most holy place, where I saw Jesus still interceding for Israel. On the bottom of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Now, this is very interesting because... This is given to us for a reason. Jesus is our high priest, and he is the antitype of the type, which was what the children of Israel had in the very beginning. Okay, the bell and the pomegranate here is very interesting because... If you read Ellen's first vision, the saints are going to hear the bells on Jesus' garment as he comes out immediately after the close of probation. So that's a real key point. Everyone needs to know that. Okay. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided, either for salvation or destruction, and that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire, and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance. Then Jesus will step out from between the Father and man, and God will keep silent no longer, but pour out his wrath on those who have rejected his truth. I saw that the anger of the nations, the wrath of God, and the time to judge the dead were separate events, one following the other. I saw that Michael had not stood up and that the time of trouble such as never was had not yet commenced. The nations are now getting angry, but when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up, put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. These plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous, and they thought that we had brought them down upon them, and if they could rid the earth of us, then the plagues would be stayed. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble." Then all the saints cried out with anguish of spirit and were delivered by the voice of God. Then the 144,000 triumphed. Their faces were lighted up with the glory of God. Then I was shown a company who were howling in agony. On their garments was written in large characters, Thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. I asked who this company were. The angel said, These are they who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. I heard them cry with a loud voice, We have believed in thy coming and taught it with energy. And while they were speaking, their eyes would fall upon their garments and see the writing, and then they would wail aloud. I saw they had drunk of the deep waters and fouled the residue with their feet, trodden the Sabbath underfoot. And that is why they were weighed in the balance and found wanting. So there's a verse in the Bible that speaks of 
this drinking of the deep waters and fouling the residue with their feet. And right here, we have the definition of what that means in at least this instance. Okay, Sabbath afternoon, one of our number was sick and requested prayers that he might be healed. We all united in applying to the physician who never lost the case. And while healing power came down and the sick was healed, the spirit fell upon me and I was taken off in vision. I saw the state of some who stood on present truth but disregarded the visions, the way God had chosen to teach in some cases, those who had erred from Bible truth. Now, I know that you have noticed that there is a, let, a number put here by different phrases. That's because this one paragraph is seven sentences, and it has nine different times that God is identified as the author of the authentic spirit of prophecy. And this is very important. This paragraph was published this one time in the 1849 broadside, and it was never seen again by, it's never published again until 1958 in volume one, or I should say uh, Selected Messages book one. That's the way we say it. Okay, um, so this is a very, very important paragraph, and I... I uh, want to encourage everyone to pay strict attention to this. I saw the state of some who stood on present truth but disregarded the visions, the way God had chosen to teach. So this is the way God had to chosen to teach, his visions through Ellen. In some cases, those who erred from Bible truth, I saw that in striking against the visions, they did not strike against the worm, the feeble instrument that God spake through. So it is God that is speaking through the authentic spirit of prophecy to you. That's the danger. This is part of the big danger of studying and reading the counterfeit because there God is not speaking through. The, he does nothing in partnership with Satan. And that's a very key point. Okay. So I saw that in striking against the visions, they did not strike against the worm, the feeble instrument that God spake through but against the Holy Ghost. What is it? All things, all manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven again, will be forgiven men, except the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Folks, be very careful what you say when it comes to the Holy Ghost. Says, I, and I have to say, there is a huge movement out there of people claiming there is no Holy Ghost, right? All there is is the Spirit of Christ or whatever. Um, huge mistake. Be careful. Repent and be converted. I saw it was a small thing to get to speak against the instrument, but it was dangerous to slight the words of God. Look at that. Those are God's words. Testimonies number 26 on page 5, which is actually the very first page of the testimony. It says that the Holy Ghost dictated the, the words that all the writers of the Bible 
spoke. That is the words of God. I thought if they were in error and God chose to show them their errors through visions. Right here, another one. God is speaking through visions. It's number five. And they disregarded the teachings of God through visions. Number six, they would be left to take their own way and run in the way of error and think they were right until they would find it out too late. Then in the time of trouble, I heard them cry to God in agony. Why did, didst thou not show us our wrong that we might have got right and been ready for this time? Then an angel pointed to them and said, My father taught. Number seven. My father taught, but you would not be taught. He spoke through visions. Number eight, but you disregarded his voice speaking through visions. Number nine, incredible paragraph. I was blown away when I found this. And he gave you up to your own ways to be filled with your own doings. December 16, 1848, the Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. I saw that when the Lord said heaven and giving the signs recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he meant heaven. And when he said earth, he meant earth. The powers of heaven are the sun, moon, and the stars. They rule in the heavens. The powers of earth are those who bear rule on earth. The powers of heaven will be shaken at the voice of God. Then the sun, moon, and stars will be moved out of their places. They will not pass away, but be shaken by the voice of God. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look up through the open space in Orion. From whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. I saw that the powers of earth are now being shaken, and that events come in their order. War and rumors of war, sword, famine, and pestilence are first to shake the powers of earth. Then the voice of God will shake the sun, moon, and stars, and this earth also. I saw that the shaking of the powers in Europe is not, as some teach, the shaking of the powers of heaven, but it is the shaking of the angry nations. So this happened back in the 1800s, and it is not applicable to us today. For two years past, the Lord has shown me in vision repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. I saw that if the saints have food laid up by them or in the fields in the time of trouble when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, it will be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. I just enjoy this because it is proof positive that probation will have closed. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God, and he will sustain us. I saw that our bread and water would be sure at that time, and we should not lack or suffer hunger. The Lord has shown me that some of his children would fear when they see the price of food rising, and they would buy food and lay it by for the time of trouble. Then in a time of need, I saw them go to their food and look at it, and it had bred worms and was full of living creatures and not fit for use. About one week since, the Lord showed me in vision that houses and lands would be of no use in the time of trouble, and in that time they could not be disposed of. I saw it was the will of God that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance, dispose of their houses and lands before the time of 
time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God by sacrifice. I saw they would sell if they laid their property on the altar and earnestly inquired for duty. Then God will teach them when to dispose of these things. Then they will be free in the time of trouble and have no clogs to weigh them down. I saw if they held on to their property and did not inquire duty of the Lord, he would not make duty known, and they would be permitted to keep their property, and then in the time of trouble their property would come up before them like a mountain to crush them. Then they tried to get rid of it, but could not. I heard them mourn like this. The cause was languishing, God's people were suffering for truth, and we made no effort to supply the lack, and now our property is useless. Oh, that we had let it go and laid up treasure in heaven. Now the reason that they could not get rid of it or sell it is because there is no buying or selling in the time of trouble. I saw that a sacrifice did not increase but decrease and was consumed. I also saw that God had not required all his people to dispose of their property at the same time, but in a time of need he would teach them if they desired to be taught when to sell and how much to sell. I saw that some had been required to dispose of their property in time past to sustain the Advent cause, while he permitted others to keep theirs until a time of need. Then, as the cause needs it, their duty is to sell. Now is the time to lay up treasure in heaven and to set our hearts in order, ready for the time of trouble. Those only who have clean hands and a pure heart will stand that trying time. Now is the time for the law of God to be in our foreheads, or in our minds, our foreheads, and written in our hearts. The Lord has shown me the danger of letting our minds be filled with worldly thoughts and cares. I saw that some minds were led away from present truth and a love of the Holy Bible by reading other exciting books, and others were filled with perplexity and care for what they shall eat, drink, and wear. I saw some looking too far off for the coming of the Lord. Time has continued on a few years longer than they expected. Therefore, they think it may continue a few years more. And in this way, their minds are being led from present truth out after the world. In these things, I saw great danger. For if the mind is filled with other things, present truth is shut out, and there is no place in our foreheads for the seal of the living God. This seal is the Sabbath. And I have to tell you, the second time this 1849 broadside was published, it was this phrase, this sentence, which is standalone, was not published at that time. I have comments for this on other times, and we'll discuss that. I saw that the time for Jesus to be in the most holy place was nearly finished, and that time can last but a very little longer, and what leisure time we have should be spent in searching the Bible, which is to judge us in the last day. My dear Brethren and sisters, let the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ be in your minds continually, and let them crowd worldly thoughts and cares from the mind. When you lie down and when you rise up, let them be your meditation. Live and act wholly in reference to the coming of the Son of Man. The sealing time is very short and soon will be over. 
Now is the time to make our calling and election sure while the four angels are holding the four winds. I want to point out in this that the testimony of Jesus Christ, as you know, is defined in the Bible as the spirit of prophecy. Very important to understand that. Furthermore, the sealing time is very short and soon will be over. Certainly in the light of eternity, it is very short, but James and Ellen believed that Christ was coming immediately. They knew that the sealing time was very short. It has now lasted over or right at 177 years is how long the sealing time has lasted so far. Get ready, because with everything that we know of current events and so forth, that the sealing time now is very short. Get ready, get ready, get ready. God bless your study.